Well, our scripture reading today will be found in Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through the first part of 3. I'll give you guys a second to find that because I cheated and I bookmarked it. All right, again, that's Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through uh, 3, the first part. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And it reads, But now, thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. May we never forget the promises of God. Good morning and happy Sabbath. <laughs> It is such a pleasure to be here with you um, this morning, and I just want to thank you for being such a warm church. From the moment I was greeted and shown around and being able to join you all with Sabbath School as well, so I felt very welcomed being here. Um, I'm going to read the scripture again uh, one more time, this time from the New Living Translation. So join me. It says, Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you go through the deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, Please be with us now as we spend some time learning about the importance of names and more, most importantly, your name. In your son's precious name I pray, amen. So you may not know me or my husband, but we have two boys named Declan and Emil, and they're ages five and six. And when Eddie and I had our boys, one of the hardest things that I found was coming up with the right name for our sons. You know, even though we had months um, to choose a name, it literally took us up until the time that our kids were born and were about to leave the hospital before we were able to come up with perfect names for them each time. We spent weeks testing out different names, trying them on, trying them with our last name to see how it would fit. And, you know, I know our story isn't unique. I know that parents usually spend days, weeks, or months trying to come up with the perfect name for their little ones. And as I discovered when we were going through our journey um, of having our kids, there are whole industries that are built up and designed around baby names. For example, there are companies like babynames.com where you can research names and their meanings. Um, you can see if there are any famous or infamous people that have the name that you might be considering for your child. And they'll also tell you about the different attributes that the name entails or, or you know, what kind of people tend to have these kind of names. And for individuals who are willing to spend $10,000 or more, there are baby naming consultants out there that will provide you with a genealogical investigation into the names that you're thinking about for your little one. For example, at that $10,000 price tag, there is a consulting company called Nameberry that offers a personalized concierge service with personal name coaching just for you um, as you come up with the name for your child. So why would people be willing to spend $10,000 with help with a name. Well, it's because you and I recognize that names matter. As one baby consultant said, they said our name is the first thing that people learn about us and it's the last thing that we leave behind. You know, names can act as identifiers. They can tell us who we belong to. They can link us to a particular family or community based on our last name. 
And for some with unique first names that have been passed on from generation to generation, there's also a linkage there with their name. And for some, the names that we've carried and that we've been given, they carry the weights of the dreams and expectations and the hopes of our parents that they've had for us. Names can be incredibly important as a part of our identity, connecting us to our family, our larger community, and even our culture. A couple days ago, we just ended Black History Month, but I was reflecting during that time on the power of names as, as part of our black history, part of my black history. And I thought about how names were used to strip away the identity of my ancestors during slavery. You know, owners would try to disconnect slaves from their identity with their homeland and even their basic humanity by forcing them to go by a new name given to them by their masters in this new land. And we also see this in, in the Bible. We see a biblical account of this. If we think about the story of the Hebrew captives who were taken from their homeland to Babylon and given new Babylonian names to replace their Jewish ones. What people knew back then and what they were aware of was that knowing who you are and where you come from is a powerful thing. Names are a powerful source of identity. And I'm, I'm not just talking here about the names that we're given at birth. No, the, the names that we carry are actually much, much broader than that. For example, how many of us still carry names with us that we were given years ago? Perhaps nicknames that we were given during childhood. You know, I have some aunts on my husband's side, but I don't, I don't even know their given name because he only refers to them as in their nicknames. So that's all I know them as. So I know that names go beyond just our given names. And for some of us, the names that we've taken with us have empowered us because people have placed names on us. They've called us names like strong and brave, smart, important, and loved. But there are others of us who've had to fight against names and labels that people have, have placed on us. Maybe it's been through a teacher that's told you you're not smart enough or a parent that says that you're not good enough. These are names that we may have internalized. And for some of us, we've carried the burden and fought against labels like failure, average, or unworthy. The sad thing is in some cases, we've given ourselves these limiting names that God never ever intended for us to have. We've self-identified with names like unforgivable and unseen. But you know, we see in the Bible that names matter there too. In the Bible, names signify the attributes or characteristics of a person. And we have many examples of this where people have changed their names or been given new names by God because of what a powerful source of identity our names are. So we see this with Abram being changed, his name being changed to Abraham, or Sarai being changed to Sarah, or Jacob taking on the new name of Israel. And our text for today in Isaiah 43 tells us that our names matter to God. He knows our name and he knows our identity. Thankfully, no matter what names you and I have identified with, we are told in Isaiah that God said our identity is found in him. As he spoke this message to the Israelites, he is telling us today who we are and more importantly, whose we are. In Isaiah, we're told that not only does God know our name, and this is important that he knows you and me individually, but he's also reminding us that he knows us more intimately than that because he created us, he formed us, and we are his. And because we are his, we don't have to worry or fear when the trials or difficulties come our way. Now, the Israelites had reason to question their identity in God's, as God's chosen people because they had drifted away from living up to being the, the chosen, promised people set apart that God had called them to be. Earlier in Isaiah, in fact, if you just look back at Isaiah 42, you can see that, that Isaiah was telling them that they had drifted away because they were calling and turning to idols instead of to the true God for their deliverance and salvation. They had forgotten where their identity and security were to be found. But in chapter 43, it starts with the word, but. And it says God, because it says God remind, is reminding them of their identity and their salvation that is found in him. First, he reminds them who they are. 
He tells them that they are his creation. They're formed by him. He reminds them that he redeemed them and he knows them intimately. And throughout the chapter, he tells them that they are his sons and daughters. He calls them redeemed. And he says that they are precious, honored, and loved. And I I ask you to look through chapter 43 and see where these names are used for God's people. As God reminded the Israelites, he reminds us now that our identity and worth are found in him. We have inherent human dignity because we are his sons and daughters made in his image. We have salvation because we're redeemed by him. We have value because he calls us precious, honored, and loved. And we have no reason to fear when trials come because he calls us by name and has claimed us as his own. And this is important. Because our text does not say that because we are his, we will not face trials or difficulties. That's, that's not what it's saying. Instead, we are told that trials, difficulties, and oppression are things that are guaranteed in this life and things that we'll all experience. You know, for the Israelites, they were in the midst of a situation that looked pretty dire. They were facing threats from the surrounding nations that they had turned to instead of God. And they were soon to fall captive to the Assyrians if they hadn't already by the time of this writing from Isaiah. So they were going through the deep waters when this message was given to them. They were going through the rivers of difficulty. And they were going through the fires of oppression as this message came to them. And for some of us, we're also going through difficulties right now, just as the Israelites were. For some, it may be a terminal cancer diagnosis or a failing marriage or financial difficulties, troubles on the job, or it may be that you have kids that are rejecting the faith that you have spent your life trying to invest in them and raise them in. Or maybe it's a struggle that you're having with loneliness or depression or anxiety. No matter what our troubles are, they are guaranteed to us in one form or another as long as we're on this earth. But we have a God who knows our name. He knows your name and mine. And he has promised that even though we will go through the deep waters, he'll be with us. Even though we will go through rivers of difficulty, we will not drown. And yes, we will go through the fire of oppression, but we will not be burned. The flames will not consume us. This is a promise in his word. You know, this assurance that God would be with the Israelites through the deep waters and through the rivers of difficulty, I know must have had a particular meaning to them because throughout their lives, they must have been told the stories of how God literally parted the waters so that their ancestors could pass through and not drown. And years later, I imagine that the three Hebrew boys must have remembered this text about going through the fires of oppression and not being burned when they were thrown into the fiery furnace because of their religious convictions. And as the Israelites looked back on how God protected them in the past, they likely remembered that as his people, they had no reason to fear their current situation either. God tells them not to fear because they are his. And, you know, the reason that we have no need to fear is not because of who we are, but it's because of who God is. We're able to have peace in the midst of life's ups and downs and unknowns and uncertainties, because when we know who God is, we can rest assured that as long as we are his, we are in good hands. And learning more about who God is helps us to find our identity and security. Now, if we go back to our scripture for today, if we look at verse 3 of the text, God tells us a little bit about who he is. He gives us some reasons for our assurance. In our scripture, God tells us that he is the Lord, our God. He says he is the Holy One of Israel, and he calls himself our Savior. These three names of God are powerful identifiers of his character. He says his name is the Lord, our God. He's the Lord, our creator, the God who is the I am, the one who holds the universe and exists outside of time and space. 
And as the Lord of creation, he's able to take us through deep waters without us drowning. No matter what impossible situation we may be staring at, even right now, we know that we serve a God who told us that he's able to do a new thing. And we see this in verse 19. He's able to make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Surely, the God who made water literally spring out of a rock can protect you from the flames that as you're walking through so that the fire of oppression will not even singe a hair on your head. He also says that not only is he the Lord, but he's the Lord our God. So he is the all-powerful God and Lord of creation, but he also wants relationship with you and me. And we see this care for us in the fact that he calls us precious sons and daughters. And the fact that he was willing to pay the price to redeem us so that we could once again be in right relationship with him. But his name is not just the Lord our God. He also says that he is the Holy One of Israel. He is set apart and deserving of reverence because of who he is, because he is the creator and the sustainer of all. We're told that his very name is holy and should not be taken lightly. We're told that we should not come into his presence indifferently because where he resides is hallowed territory. And God's pureness, his righteousness, and his glory reveals our utter uncleanness and our unworthiness to even come into his presence. But thankfully, he also identifies himself as our savior. He loves us too much to leave us separated from him, to leave us in our current state of being apart from him because of our sin. And instead, he paid the ransom price through the death of his son so that we could be reconciled to him. He saved us so that we can be in right relationship with him once again. And as the one who redeemed us and as the one who originally created us to begin with, he's able to claim us as his own because of his sacrifice. You know, as powerful as these three names are as descriptors of God, as we look through the Bible, we can find many, many more. God knew that in our limited human understanding, we would need a vast amount of names to try to even grasp the beginnings of who God is and his attributes. And what I love about the names of God are that depending on the season of life that you or I may be facing, there is a name of God that is there to meet our particular situation. So when I look back on my life, I think about a couple names that have significance to me. For example, the name Father it became more meaningful and more powerful to me when I became a parent because the love of a parent for their child is just something that I couldn't fully grasp until I became one myself. The name friend, that name had particular significance to me when I moved to a city where I didn't know anyone and the only friend I could really call on that time was God until, until he introduced me to some more people. And then the name comforter, that name for me had significant, partic uh, particular significance about three years ago when my dad was diagnosed with a very aggressive cancer that took, took his life. And I found comfort and peace that could only come from God. And so at that time, the name Comforter had particular significance and meaning in my life. You see, God wants us to know his names and his attributes, but, but more than that, he wants us to experience them for ourselves. They, you know, he tells us, taste and see that the Lord is good. He wants us to taste and see for ourselves his goodness and his attributes. And as we spend more time with him and experience more of who he is, we're called also to be reflections of him to those who we come in contact with. As his followers, we're called to be revelations of his character to a world that is in darkness. We're called to be that city on a hill. We're called to be the light in the midst of darkness that draws people to him. People should be drawn to God by observing us and by interacting with us. They should want to know who God is from their encounter with us. When people hear the name Christian, followers of Christ, they should think those are the people full of love and joy and peace and patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. However, when people hear the name Christian these days, or the name Seventh-day Adventists, what names do you think actually come to their mind? Now, some of you may have been wondering, you know, as great as this talk is about the name, about our name and God's names, 
why are we talking about this for, um, why am I talking about this as the public affairs and religious liberty director? Well, you know, the, the, the issue of names and identity is very much tied to the work of Pearl. Or the issue is really about how we represent God's name and his identity to the world around us. In my role as Pearl director for the Lake Union Conference, I've noticed that um, our church members tend to be familiar with the religious liberty work that we engage in as a church. We're pretty good about advocating for religious liberty. We talk about it. It tends to be the focus um, when we have religious liberty Sabbaths. And this is because since our founding, our church has advocated for the principles of religious liberty. We believe that the freedom to worship is tied to our in-time understanding of the great controversy. We understand that there's a battle between God and Satan as to whether God forces our worship or allows us to freely give it to him. And we believe that there will be a day when people will be told when to worship and how to worship against the dictates of their conscience. And so as a church, you know, we have historically been active in protecting religious freedom for all, even for those with no religious beliefs at all. As a church, we believe in the importance of a clear separation between church and state. And we see this as the best way for religion to flourish. And so we advocate on behalf of all to be free to worship without coercion or interference from the state. And this is part of why we have the Religious Liberty Campaign each year, because it's a time to remind members that promoting religious freedom is important. You know, there are many members, even here in Lake Union, even here in Michigan Conference, who are facing discrimination, even today, because of their religious beliefs. They're having to choose between keeping their jobs or following their conscience. And I've, I've been blessed to be able to help some of these individuals, but some are still, are still in the midst of this trial right now of, of how to maintain their religion and their religious convictions in the face of lo losing their jobs. But if we go beyond Michigan, go beyond Lake Union, go beyond the North American division, and we look at this globally, Around the world, over 75% of individuals do not have religious freedom. They don't have the ability to worship freely. And for many, it's an issue of life or death. So religious liberty is important, but it's an aspect of Pearl that's pretty well understood. But the other piece of Pearl is the public affairs piece. And this part of my work focuses on how we as a church engage with society. Do people know who we as Adventists are? Do they see us as a good in their communities? The public affairs work focuses on spreading the identity, message, and mission of our church by mingling with people and sharing the distinct Adventist message. From the General Conference website on, for Pearl, it says the ministry is focused on positioning the Seventh-day Adventist Church and its services to a standing of credibility, trust, and relevance in the public realm. In this sense, the work of Pearl is tied to issues around the name and identity of the church. So here's my question for you. When people hear the name Seventh-day Adventists, what names do you think come to mind? Do you think it's, oh, those are those strange people that eat weird foods? Or, oh, those are those legalists who have a long list of do's and don'ts. Or maybe when they've been asked who the Seventh-day Adventists are, they say, I have never heard of those people before. Who are they? When people hear the name Christian in today's society, what do you think comes to mind? You know, unfortunately for many, the name, even the name Christian, conjures up images of bigoted individuals who want to impose their way of life on everyone else. And in this sense, I think Christians have done a major disservice to the name Christian, followers of Christ. Are we known as Christians by our love? Think about this. Too many people don't know the work that we're doing in our communities. And our church has done a lot of good in our communities. We have ADRA responding to the humanitarian needs worldwide. But we also have Adventist Community Service who are here uh, responding to the humanitarian needs in our own community. 
We hold free health clinics. And you know, we're in Detroit, they're gearing up for the health clinic that's going to take place next week. And we have an educational system that's one of the largest in the world. But there's more that we can and should be doing. Because unfortunately, there are still people, in, even in our community, who don't know who we are as Seventh-day Adventists, or what we believe, or the God that we say that we serve. And, you know, I was thinking about the power of names, and it made me think that even our name, our very name Seventh-day Adventist, has meaning and power behind it that could bring hope to somebody today. There's a message of truth and hope built into the name that our early um, founders of this church had instilled. Because our name says that we keep the fourth commandment of God. It says that we keep all the commandments, including the fourth, to keep the Sabbath day holy, that links us back to creation, that reminds us that we are created in God's image, that tells us that we are, um, have inherent human dignity and we have inherent human worth because of that. Our name also tells us that we're anticipating the soon return of Jesus Christ to take us home with him. We have hope and assurance in the soon return of our Savior. And when people hear our name, they should think of more than simply people who don't eat certain foods and go to church on Saturdays. We have a name and an identity that we should be proud to share with the world because our name matters and it could bring hope to a world where so many individuals are feeling hopeless. We have a work to do because how are people going to know us and the hope that we have as Seventh-day Adventist Christians if we aren't in the community sharing the good news, not just through preaching, but by serving the needs of those around us? I want to encourage us to be people of hope in our community by ministering to the needs as Jesus did. I want to encourage us to be involved in helping address the issues, concerns, and needs of our communities. As Jesus told his disciples in John 13, verses 34 and 35, people will know whether we are indeed his followers based on how we love each other. When people hear the name Seventh-day Adventist Christian, they should think of people who love as Jesus did. The name should mean something positive to those we interact with. Let's reflect his love by being his hands and his feet to a world in need, and by speaking out for those who don't have a voice. Because love is not passive. Love is a verb. It is active. It requires action. Love and action is an Isaiah 58 kind of love, and it's a Matthew 25 kind of love. It's a love that calls us to set the oppressed free, to provide shelter for the poor wanderer, to feed the hungry and to clothe the naked, to care for the sick and to visit and care for those who are in prison. It's a love that meets the needs of those around us in a non-judgmental way. And it's a love that serves because it's what we're called to do. My prayer for us as a church is that as we engage with our community, that people, when they hear the name Seventh-day Adventist Christian, they'll think of a people who reflect the attributes and character of God, and they'll want to know more about this God that we say we serve. And as we engage in this kind of love and action in our communities, they will know that there is a loving God out there and be drawn to learn, to learn more about him and the peace and assurance that can be found when we find our identity and our calling in him. You know, if this is your prayer as well, please stand with me as we pray. Lord, please let your name be glorified in how we interact with others, especially those in this community, with our neighbors, with those we interact with, so that they will be drawn to you through their interaction with us. Lord, I ask this in the powerful, precious, holy, matchless name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.